Dr. Taubman is the director of the Division of Pain Medicine at the University of Washington. He holds appointments as an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine and uh, in the Department of Medicine. He's the director of medical student and resident education, and he's also the director of a program uh, that he and his group started called the University of Washington Telepain Medicine Service, which um, allows community physicians to call in uh, to a, a university program which will um, uh, in which they can present cases and get advice as to how to treat um, people with chronic pain. Dr. Talbin. Thanks a lot, Lee. Appreciate it. Okay, great audience, and I, this, I think, is my second trip to your fourth, so I miss your first two, and I want to just applaud uh, particularly uh, Jim Shames uh, and, of course, the whole team, but Jim in particular, for uh, having reached out four years ago and collaborating with us in, in, the, in Seattle, and uh, we're running on the same track at about parallel speed, and I just told him before I walked in here, we're going to have to pick up the pace uh, in Seattle, because you guys are doing such a great job. Uh, so uh, my goals are uh, uh, to actually talk about uh, what uh, actually uh, a lot of people have quoted Mark Sullivan is coming up next. He's got a, good, a lot of good one-liners. Thank you, Mark. Is the post-opioid era. Uh, and so uh, how do we get there? Uh, we heard how we got here. Uh, uh, and we know where we are, and we're going to talk about it, uh, next steps. So uh, nothing that's going to be a, a challenge. I've got some uh, grant support through... Uh, the Erla REMS, I'll mention it very briefly, that's the Extended Release Long Acting REMS Education Program. Uh, we received uh, a continuation of our award for uh, Center of Excellence in Pain Education from NIH, uh, which only allows me a little more time to be able to work on uh, these sorts of trips. Uh, and I will regularly talk about uh, uh, medications that are not labeled uh, for pain, uh, because most of what we use in pain is not labeled, and frankly, a lot of what we is, la is labeled, we have learned, is, has no evidence of effect. Uh, so we're going to try to uh, walk through this uh, conundrum. So I'm going to talk a bit about risks and benefits. This got some new standards for use of opiates in chronic non-cancer pain. And then mostly focus on emerging models of primary care-based pain assessment and treatment tracking. And my perspective is uh, I primary care internal medicine training at the University of Washington and 27 years of private practice in a primary care setting that had chronic pain as a very significant portion of my practice. So I have really been in the trenches with you all and I know your pain. Uh, 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 and we know how pain is distressing not only to our patients uh, uh, but also to uh, providers of care. And I hope uh, at the end of this talk uh, first, let me start by saying how many here in this room look forward to the arrival in their morning practice of a two or three patients with chronic pain on their schedule? Okay, I'm the only one. Uh, two, we've got three. All right. I hope at the end you'll f be more able, and if Jim is kind enough to have me out again at your next session uh, next year, we'll see if we can get 10 or 20, because it isn't that hard to do. Uh, fourth year medical students at Day 10 of their rotation with me are slamming it. They're doing all, everything right. They don't know what the problem is. And their learning point at the end was, uh, I didn't realize these patients were so nice when they started. Now they know how nice they are. And I can do something for them. And so my goal is that you can do something for them and you don't need to use opiates for accomplishing that. And therefore make more informed pain drug treatments in the outpatient setting. So being an internist, I've got to quote William Osler, uh, and I think this is one of the biggest problems in the field of uh, chronic pain management is we just lump people into a chronic pain patient, which I view as a derogatory uh, term uh, because of the way it's said, and it also says everyone's the same and we know everyone is different. So we need to recognize it, uh, and there's some emerging work, and I think in my own experience, I think I really do understand pain, thanks to John Lozier mentoring me back in my training years. Uh, and paying attention for the years. Uh, 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 Mosley, uh, physical therapist in uh, uh, Australia, is doing some work that has identified that if the provider of pain care understands pain, the outcomes of treatment response in their patients is increased by 50%. 
So that mirror neuroning that we do with our patients, or we should be doing when we're interacting, is enhanced if we understand it, and they will abide and accept our treatments much more effectively. So hopefully the talks this morning have you understand pain a bit better, and during the lunch break I cut out a couple of my repetition slides, so we're going to get right to the meat. Uh, but also thorough assessment of the common biopsychosocial domains. You know, as uh, the medical people, I, I teach my, uh, my physician, uh, and other medicine colleagues that we got to get the bio right. We need to understand what's happening. That's the first step. But then we have to recognize the social and psychological uh, parameters. Uh, Dan Carr has said, uh, another luminary in the uh, uh, field of pain, that we need to flip the paradigm, and I think this is very important, from the biopsychosocial to the social psychobio. Because in, as we know that most of what's driving the challenges that we have is the social and psychological. And many of us, I saw the number of hands that went up that are you know, really in the trenches in the clinic, uh, are not adequate. We need more help than we get. And that's one of our failures. So that leads me to uh, Eloise Carr. I, I heard her talk five years ago. And she basically said the consensus opinion in a pain clinic, uh, before they set it up, they interviewed the community. This is true patient-centered care before they built the clinic. They said, what do you want from a pain clinic? They said, stop trying to cure me and start listening. And I think that's probably the most important thing. It's the method of our delivery of treatment that probably affects outcome. We know how important a placebo response. We know how important, and I'll talk more about how treatment and patient engagement in our treatment is so critically important. So we really have to acknowledge the patient, the centeredness of that patient. We need to sit down. How many times do we just do our exams standing? We know that if you sit, multiply by five the patient's perception of the time we spend with them. So it's sit. Don't have your hand on the door. I know primary care people don't do that, but I find myself sometimes standing because I'm on a busy schedule as well. We have about six minutes, it's current estimates, to manage chronic pain in a practice. That's if you don't do all the preventative health care measures that take uh, 7.5 hours, if you did them every day on all your patients, uh, you'd have no time, and then you had 45 minutes for the electronic medical record, uh, and then your day's done. Uh, uh, and uh, you get seven other complaints concurrent with pain, uh, and 70% of every visit is about pain. 30% of primary care visits includes chronic pain. Uh, and you have probably two hours to seven hours of training uh, so far, so you really don't know what you're doing. Yeah, so you don't blame yourself. You know, I didn't know what I was doing either, and I made all the mistakes that, are, that we've heard today, getting my patients up on high doses. And this is not a confession here. This is saying that it's tough work, but we do know, as Jim said at the opening introduction, we don't new, need new breakthroughs and new opiate use deterrent drugs and fancy ways of delivering opioids. Uh, we need to just do what we have already learned, and uh, we'll be walking through that. Uh, so don't. Uh, Interrupt your patient. We know how quickly we interrupt patients. Uh, it takes about 11 seconds for the average internist to interrupt the patient answering the question that they asked. Uh, and when told to s that they're going to be filmed and timed, they go up to 16 seconds before they interrupt. So it's very hard to, uh, to accomplish that, but that's the narrative that we have to hear from our patients. It's critically important. Uh, we can redirect and move patients where we need to go. And the art is learning how to listen, move it without interrupting and uh, being apologetic by that interruption, but just be able to acknowledge the patients to center. Listen to the story. It's much more important than the technological data which we immerse ourselves in. This is the imaging studies, et cetera. And then a uh, recommendation for all providers of pain care is have a regular meeting with the rest of your team so you can talk about your case in a safe place. Not with the disciplinary boards, uh, not in a total public audience, but just sit down and talk it out. And oftentimes you'll say to yourself, what am I doing here? Uh, because it just feels good to talk about these challenging patients. So save some time, build it into your, uh, your clinic if possible. Some predictors of abnormal pain response. Uh, certainly on the history and exam, demonstration of non-anatomic territory, presence of depression or pre-existing mood disorder, distress socioeconomic status, and we'll hear a bit about sad life syndrome from uh, Dr. Sullivan. I don't know how he'll characterize it, but uh, severe socioeconomic distress and terrible life circumstances drives so much of our prescribing behavior. Uh, poor life coping, and then pre-existing pain conditions. Fibromyalgia is a good example. Uh, doing a fibromyalgia-ness test. Dan Claus recommend you just Google fibromyalgia-ness. 
You can score patients. You can predict outpatient or preoperative poor outcomes. Active emotional distress, and then prior uh, surgical complications of a, or a repeat surgery for a condition that a patient's already had surgery on that hasn't gone well. These are obvious. It doesn't take much time to be able to organize it. Uh, I'm going to fly by this uh, uh, simply for the sake of time, but adverse childhood events uh, are highly predictive of lots of bad things. Now, what's not on this list yet, because we don't have the published reports to describe this, uh, the academic folks need to do this, is to put chronic pain on the, this list as well, because there's no doubt that uh, having a tough childhood. We do know uh, that uh, uh, children are not little adults. Uh, but as Gary Walker said, adults are really little children. And what he means is that if an adolescent or child has chronic pain, they are guaranteed to be a patient with chronic pain as an adult. Uh, and what causes chronic pain in childhood and adolescence unrelated to cancer or terrible trauma and burns is almost always a horrific home situation and family situation. So you've got to pay attention to this stuff in taking your history. Uh, Unclassifiable right now because the neurologists won't own this, rheumatologists won't own this, so pain people own this, and frankly, primary care people own this. Uh, this is an old report from Muhammad Yunus, a rheumatologist, uh, identifying a whole host of centralized pain syndromes. And I put this up to just note that pain often comes syndromically, lots of things happen at the same time. Fibromyalgia at the top, uh, uh, interstitial cystitis, chronic pelvic pain syndromes, uh, myofascial pain syndromes, temporomandibular disorders, tension headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue. These all come together in a cluster. These are the positive review of systems patients. Positive review of systems suggests that there's a centralized syndrome. These people are going to be sensitive to everything, even smells, even drug use. They're going to have adverse reactions to. So patients who have a med list that has intolerances and allergies to more drugs than decades of life, to me, is added to the syndromic diagnosis of someone who's going to have a poor outcome to any treatment that you're going to offer. Uh, again, as I mentioned, 30% uh, of primary care visits involve chronic pain, scant education and training, haven't got time for pain. That's a Carly Simon song you may recognize, but it still, it still fits. Uh, Key is limited or no access to multidisciplinary pain care. We just don't have it. This is a transformation of care that has to take place, and it's going to have to come both from the grassroots and from top down to be able to get access to these systems of care. And as a result, opiates have become the de facto treatment. Uh, and uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, again, uh, looking at who delivers pain care, uh, mostly in the primary care setting, there's a variety of different data on that about. 52%, depending on the nature of your practice and your geography, it can be as high as uh, 70%. Uh, I like the emergency department. Uh, that's a good place to get a chronic illness managed. Uh, that's 20%. I've, uh, estimates are up as high as 30% of chronic pain care is treated in the emergency department. So uh, many of you probably do cover emergency departments. Uh, it, there is actually guidelines specific for emergency room departments. And in fact, emergency medicine residents can now do a pain fellowship and sit for the ABA pain specialty boards, as can family practice. So you can get this extra education probably too late in many of your career, but it is something that we recognize now as being a primary care problem. Only 2% of pain care is de delivered by pain experts, pain physicians, and therefore this has to be done by you, which is why it's important to understand this. Well, we ran into a lot of obstacles. Roger did a nice job summarizing the challenges and why we have had this push to opioids. American Medical Association in 2004 basically said the undertreatment of pain is a major societal problem, and then they went on to say it's all about being afraid of opioids. Uh, this was part of a whole wave of, trans of changing attitudes uh, and the big swing of the pendulum, which has us uh, where we are right now. Uh, they are alluring, and I thank uh, Mark Sullivan again. Thank you, Mark, uh, for uh, helping me with this list. They make patients happy, uh, at least initially. Uh, they're very available, even in the most remote locations. You can't get a CBT provider or a pain-trained physical therapist or a mindfulness-based stress reduction provider or any of the other things that work. Uh, but you sure go to a pharmacy and get your Oxycontin filled. That's simple as simple as can be. Insurance, sadly, and I'd say pathetically and perversely, pays better for drug treatments, opioid treatments, than they do for psychological therapies, which we know are key 
Uh, you can spend $1,200 a month getting your Oxycontin prescription refilled, uh, and that $1,200 a month would cover 10 CBT treatments, which is typically what it takes to manage it, and you've got the problem solved, and you haven't killed your patient. Uh, and then the way to get out of the exam room, as we all know, is pull out your prescription pad. Right, you pull it out, and the whole, everyone sighs. The patient, oh, I'm through this ordeal. <laughs> I've passed the test, and you say, gosh, I'm out of this office, I can catch up on my schedule, because you're running an hour late, and your, your pager's gone off four times. Uh, so, an opiate trial. A trial means will it work? So if you're gonna be using opioids or any treatment, you gotta manage and assess the tools to determine if it's effective. So, well, I'm gonna be spending some more time, and I'm gonna start by saying a trial means a trial means if it doesn't work, you stop. And that's one of the biggest problems we have with opioids. We slip into the prescription, we say come back in a month or three, and before we know it, the patient's been on drugs for six months, and we know that patients on opiates longer than 90 days have a 62 to 65% chance of being on opiates for the rest of their life. This is a clock that starts ticking when you start prescribing opiates, so pay attention to when you start, trial it. Measure and track pain intensity and function, we'll go over the tools in a moment. Assess behavioral health issues, evaluate addiction risk. We saw the ORT well demonstrated earlier, very good screener. Notice in the opiate risk tool that uh, question four, I believe, have you been exposed to pre-adolescent sexual abuse? I would argue with uh, the Websters because it applies to men too. How many people have treated uh, prostodinian men? How many people have succeeded in managing prostodynia? I didn't manage prostodynia correctly until I learned that 90% of these men have sexual abuse as men. We don't consider that a significant issue, and it can often be gender uh, uh, identity issues that are associated with that, uh, and it was remarkable how many, I just stopped having the men go in and get a prostate massage, which was actually revisiting the sexual abuse experience that they're conflicted with, paradoxically. So maybe that's exposure therapy, which is a treatment, but uh, it's probably not the way it was designed by the therapist. Uh, uh, and measure, of course, compliance and adherence monitoring, as we heard earlier, with urine drug toxicology. And the best thing I've ever seen in 15 years of pain care are the prescription monitoring programs. Washington State, pathetically, 23% of prescribers are enrolled, uh, and less than half use it because uh, it's clunky, it's a pain in the neck, and we have six minutes and we had another two minutes to get access to that thing. We don't have time even to write the opiate prescription, for God's sake. So uh, we're really in trouble. Uh, so let's understand the opiate uh, uh, choices. I'm mentioning these basically because it's, I think, part of understanding our treatments is recognizing that there are differences between extended release and long-acting opioids and short-acting opioids. Uh, there is an opportunity, the, the FDA, has mandated the drug companies that manufacture these to provide training and education for prescribers who are gonna use these drugs, the long acting, the stuff on the right there. Uh, you have access to that. If enough people don't take the course and finish the exam, it's gonna become mandatory. Uh, currently it's voluntary. Uh, this is a site that uh, I've been involved in and uh, uh, I make no money from it, so this is not uh, uh, a disclosure, but this is access to take the course uh, and be able to be trained in understanding these uh, particular drugs. This is the COPE-REMS uh, program. So why do we use long-acting opiates in the first place? We learned from Dr. Dr. Chow earlier that these are the drugs that uh, are most commonly used in our addicts. These are the drugs that we most commonly use in our severely psychologically and psychiatrically impaired patient, and these are the drugs that lead to the most overdoses. So we're giving these high-dose, long-acting drugs to our most vulnerable population. And uh, my daughter now 22, but she used to say six years ago, a duh. Uh, no wonder they're all dying. Uh, and uh, that's not a surprise at all. So why are we choosing them? No rationale. It was thought that it makes sense. We wouldn't get people hooked on, I hurt, I take a pain drug, I hurt, I take a pain drug. Let's smooth it out. No evidence to support that, uh, that they work any better. That was included in the, in the great work that uh, uh, Roger did with uh, Judy Turner and others uh, in the publication of uh, the uh, lack of efficacy. Uh, not a clear demonstrate, and most patients, the key point, prefer the short-acting opioid. Isn't that interesting? And this gets to our tapering strategies. Short-acting opioids, they have control. Lots of incident pain studies have been done. Push this button, it's like an elevator button that shuts the door or a crosswalk. 
that shuts the door, which don't work. They make us feel better. Uh, give it a button, placebo button, uh, and told that if you do this, the shock will be 50% less. And sure enough, the shock was 50% less, even though there was no difference whatsoever. So being in control makes a huge difference. And this was really underappreciated in the long and shorts. And I frankly have no idea why we should even use long-acting opiates for chronic pain anyhow at this point, because there's no evidence to support their use, perhaps at very, very low dose. So again, conventional wisdom uh, on the left, a stable, scheduled fewer pills. There's a trend towards more worse outcomes. I can't really see the justification for that. So best approach, I think, is whatever gets your patient to function best. And we have to measure that. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, whatever the patient is least non-compliant with, I think all our patients are non-compliant. We know that n not taking drugs on schedule is the norm. Uh, and it's very common, but whatever the patient is least non-compliant makes sense. And whatever your lowest MED, lowest morphine equivalent dose, that's the way to go because we know that's the safest. Um, uh, and simply based on risk harm reduction strategies. Multiple guidelines are out there. Uh, up on the top right are yours, which are fabulous, prettier than yours, and ours on the left. Uh, easier to get access to. I had uh, 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 guideline envy when I saw your publication because they were so slick. We're going to try to catch up. Uh, our new guidelines are going to come out in July uh, this year. Uh, they're not going to be that much different, although they're more expanded. But you can see how many other states, this is just the sampling. I went through logos and put it out just to see that most states are now turning out guidelines. I guess 26 states right now, Roger, that was what you quoted. And there's more coming down the pike. Uh, the CDC did a really nice job. They took a, the guidelines and homogenized them into one. And they have seven points. I don't have time to read them through. But basically, do a history and exam, do some adherence monitoring, consider treatment options, weighing risks and benefits. I mean, this is just basic medical care. This is you know, 101 quality of medicine. Start at the lowest dose, implement treatment agreements, monitor